How does God reveal His glory? How does God reveal His glory? This is a picture of light coming through the clouds. There's a little break in the clouds and the light that's coming through. You actually see the beams of light. I don't know if you've ever uh, looked this up or, or looked at it. These are called God's rays or God's light. The, the technical uh, term for them is crepuscular. They're cre uh, crepuscular uh, rays, which just means twilight. And, and the reason I wanted to show them to you is if it were just light, like you walk out of a movie theater and it's bright outside. It's really light, but you don't see light rays. You just, it's just bright. In fact, you can't see very well because it's just all light. And if you walk, from, you're outside and you walked into a dark room, even if it's not completely dark, because you were in the light, you walk into the dark and it's just dark and you don't see anything. So in the light, you see stuff. You don't see the light. And in the dark, you don't see anything. But when you look at the crepuscular clouds, you actually are see, or lights, you're actually seeing the light rays. And so for centuries, they called these God's light or God's rays because in the clouds at twilight, which is what crepuscular means, it, you can actually see the rays of light only because it's broken up by the shadow of the clouds. And so in the midst of the clouds, the shadows caused by the clouds, you can see what look like individual rays of light. But, but really, are there individual rays of light, like you know, 10 million flashlights that just turned on and they're shooting individual rays of light? That's not what's happening in this image. What's really happening? There's one light. And the light is being broken up by a bunch of clouds. And the light moving around the cloud shows you both the, the rays of light and the shadowed area of the sky. And so, because you're seeing sky that has light and sky that does not, you can actually see not just what the light illuminates, but the light. You can see the light. Now, is that ironic to anyone besides me? How does God reveal His glory? In the second chapter of Ephesians, we're going to look at how God shows something that we're desperate for, His peace. How He reveals that in our life is in contrast. And most of what we know that's true, we learn in contrast. We know that condemnation of the law shows us the need for the goodness of His grace. That our trials in life show us the joy that we can have with Christ as our life. Otherwise, what do we think the source of the joy is? Everything's going great in that person's life. That's why they're happy. We can't tell the difference because if everything is light, it just looks light outside. But if you see someone who's in crisis and they have joy, guess what it shows? It shows the joy of Christ as their life. Our weakness is the context in which God reveals His strength in our life. Our inadequacy is used to show His grace supplied sufficiency. It's in the very contrasts of our inability and His competency, our desperation and His supply, our hopelessness and His divine hope, our neediness and His saturating supply by grace. It's in those contrasts that we see what is truly divine. It's amidst the clouds that we see not just what the light would reveal, but the light. Because I can see lots of things that are of God, but how do I see God? How does He reveal His glory? The only way that I can see His glory is in contrast. And the only way I can know His peace is in contrast chaos, in lack of peace, in circumstances that aren't in and of themselves peaceful. Otherwise, what makes it godly peace if it's worldly peaceful? I don't know why I couldn't say that very well. Worldly peaceful. So in Ephesians chapter 2, the second half of that, we're going to see that even his peace is revealed in contrast. But also, not just how it's revealed, but why. Not just how we can embrace his peace, but why it's set up that way. So look with me in chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 11. We'll put it up here, but if you have your Bible, you can read along. This is the ESV. Paul says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, meaning heathens or barbar barbarians, people who were not born Jews, one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, meaning the unchosen of God. 
by what is called the circumcision. In other words, they called you something. There's an us and a them. All right? So, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you, at that time, were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, it's the second time in this chapter that he says, here's where you were, but then God intervened in the way only God can. But now, in Christ Jesus, you, who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, the Gentile and the Jew, the circumcision and the uncircumcision. He is our peace, and he's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There's so much here, both uh, in theology and in application. We're only going to be able to scratch the surface tonight. But number one, I see that Jesus isn't just our peace with God. He's not talking about a peace with God, that God's okay with you now. What's he talking about? He's talking about a peace with whom? With someone else. That Jesus Christ is our peace, not just with God, but he is our peace with one another. Why is that? Why would Jesus Christ be your peace with the person across the aisle or across town or across cultures or competing against you at work or in conflict with you in your home? Why is he your source of peace between you and your spouse? Why is Jesus Christ your peace in every area of conflict and chaos? Why is he your peace? How does that work? Because apart from him, one, I don't have any peace, but two... All of the needs that I have that are real, apart from him, I try to get met from you. You're either my, how I'm going to get my needs met, my way of meeting my own needs is to get what I want from you or feel like I deserve from you. I need respect, you're going to be my source. I need, or, and if you're not being my source, then I have to make you wrong. I need affirmation, so I'm going to either do what I need to do to get affirmation from you, or if you're not affirming me, then I've got to do whatever is necessary to justify why you're wrong and I'm not. So if I have these very real needs, I need uh, to be recognized in my work, I need to have value in other people's minds, I need to uh, belong and be accepted... My identity crisis with your name on it means either I'm going to get you to meet my needs or I'm going to make you wrong for not meeting my needs because I can't afford, apart from Christ, to be wrong and to be without my needs being met. See, the, the reality of having Christ as our source is not that you no longer have any needs. If you've shown up at church and I or someone else have ever told you that in Christ you have no needs, that's a lie. In Christ all your needs are met, but the needs are still real. You still need affirmation. You still need respect. You still need security. You still need hope. You still need everything that you needed as an unbeliever. The difference is you know your source is Jesus Christ. And in Him your needs are met. So he's our peace with one another. And he's our peace between cultures. And he's our peace between churches and theologies. And he's our peace in all of these areas of life. Not because he's going to make us love each other so we get along better. But because I'm no longer using you to meet my needs or condemning you for not meeting them. You're no longer a liability to me if Christ is my source. When he meets my needs, my spouse is neither the source nor the uh, obstacle to my needs being met. I love that both Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul, well and for that matter, Adam himself had needs. They're in the right relationship with God and Jesus is sweating drops of blood before he goes to the cross, and Paul is in great calamity, saying, take this thorn from me, and Adam himself was created without a sin nature, brought to life with the very breath of God, and needed companionship, and all of them had an unmet need, and it wasn't because they weren't right with God, and it wasn't because they didn't have him as their life, and he wasn't their source, it wasn't because God was withholding, it was because he wanted them to know that they could not be their source. 
They couldn't produce what they needed. They couldn't earn it from someone else. And they could easily have been at war with their circumstances. But because God was their source, what did they all do? Adam tried to meet his need for companionship, and then he decided that he couldn't. Nothing is going to be a good companion for me. He gave up on himself as his source. Paul went to God and said, God, fix this. Take this thorn from me. I can't do it. I can't fix it. I can't do what I want to do. And Jesus' response is, my grace is sufficient for you, meaning you aren't supposed to be able to do it apart from me. I'm not trying to make you more competent. I'm trying to make you more dependent. And Jesus himself, in perfect relationship with the Father, never having acted out on any independence from his Father, ever, did not want to be saddled, if you will, with the consequence of independence, having never chosen to be independent, didn't want to go to the cross, didn't want to become sin for us. What a great thing. Who would want to become something that they never had chosen to be? Who would want the consequence of something they had never chosen to do? He had never sinned. He didn't want to suffer the consequence of sin. And so he said, Father, Father. That's a real relationship, right? That's not a hopeful relationship. That's a real relationship. You are my dad, Father, God, Creator. Father, take this cup from me. You can do all things. But don't do what I want. Do what you want because this circumstance is not going to be my source, nor is it going to be my obstacle. You are my source. Bring about your glory with me however you desire. You be my source. You be the decider. All of three of those men and everybody else in history <laughs> and you and I have unmet needs. And it causes us to feel unpeaceful. And so the question is, if Jesus Christ is your peace, first of all, how is it that he's your peace? And second of all, why? Why is it set up this way? And I would say the reason is, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of lack, in the midst of my not feeling respected or being rejected or not being affirmed or not having security in circumstances that would warrant feeling that way, in the midst of that, if I can stand in the life of Christ, accepted, belonging, loved, empowered, valued, and hopeful in circumstances that dictate the exact opposite, then clearly in the midst of the clouds of my life, his light becomes becomes more obvious, and I think that's the why. But what about the how? Let's look a little further. Apart from him, I don't just have needs. I have a need of you, but in him I can have peace with you because you're no longer my source. But number two, what I get out of that passage is where I'm seeking peace, I always find unpeace. Where I'm seeking life, I always find unlife. We were talking in the uh, breakout group just before we got started about uh, something that I said uh, two weeks ago was the biggest problem that the unbeliever, unbelieving world has, they don't know how dead they are, right? They're trying to live life from things that can't produce life. And the biggest problem of the believer is they don't know how alive they are. They don't know how to live from what they've already got. And, and so we both live as unbelievers, but one of us are as a believer. The unbeliever lives as an unbeliever, and the believer lives as an unbeliever, right? I'm living as if God is not enough, and the person that doesn't have God isn't able to experience God is enough. So we're both just trying to get our needs met. One of us is trying to use God to meet my needs from the world. God, I'm living for you. Why aren't you blessing me with financial security? I'm living for you. Why aren't you blessing me with relational security that gives me my needs and my values and my uh, you know, affirmation? I'm living for you. Why aren't you bringing about what I want in my circumstances? And if that's what's necessary, then what are we saying? That God isn't enough for me. God is just the source of what I want from my life to be the source of my peace and security and affirmation. If my job is my security, if my uh, marriage is my affirmation, if my career is my value, then God just becomes the means by which I get my needs met from somewhere else. But if he really is my source, then I don't need you to be my source. And I don't need to be good enough to justify what I want you to do. And I don't have to condemn you for not doing it. Like, I'm right and you're wrong, and that's why I can feel good about myself, even when you reject me. 
and I can stop living in all the coping mechanisms to self-soothe in the midst of circumstances that would dictate my emotions as I come to know that they are not my source. Now we've already said that we have unmet needs and I don't think that's an ungodly thing. I think the godly thing is to know who my source is for getting those needs met and that God uses those to bring us to dependence with him. To experience more of him as my life but to do it in a way that reveals that life. To, that reveals the light of God amidst the clouds of my circumstances. That, that it's always going to be in contrast that he brings those things about and we don't want that. We want peace from God that we're walking around like we're in clouds. Oh, life is perfect all the time. I'm loving everything. Right? And circumstances bear that out. Right? I'm perfect with God, he's meeting my needs, and I just happen to be loved by everybody. Right? That's what we want. We want, every, we want God to give us peace and no traffic. <laughs> we, want, right? we want God to wake us up with a spring in our step and a double dose of espresso. We want everything. We want it from him and from the world, and it just doesn't work that way. And so how does he bring about revealing his life so that his glory is made manifest in us? Well, the how is he uses our needs to bring us to dependence and then him meeting our needs in circumstances that don't look like our needs are being met. People go, what's the life that I see in the midst of their circumstances? What's the light that I see in their circumstances in the midst of the clouds? And I want there to be no clouds. I want there to be no clouds. I want there to just be light in my circumstances, in my relationship with God, in my finances, in my health, in my marriage, in, with my daughter, in every circumstance, I want there to be no darkness. And the problem is, light is made manifest in darkness. Without the darkness, all I'm going to see is whatever the light reveals, and that's great. But if everybody sees peace in my life, and no one sees crisis in my life at the same time, then God doesn't get the glory, I get the glory. Look how great Mike's doing at life. Let me tell you, Mike is not any good at life. Jesus Christ is great at life. And I keep trying to figure out what I need to do for me to get good instead of letting him be good enough. What does it look like to be dependent instead of trying to cause and create and produce for ourselves? And as believers, we just want to put God's name on it. Let's just stitch that on there. I want to bring about a, a I'm going to do a great job and it's because God's blessing me. Yeah, that's why. That's why everybody loves me, because God's blessing me. It's okay for God to give me favor, and I pray for favor. But let me tell you, I'm not living for favor in circumstances when I already have favor from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My problem is, I'm not satisfied with what I've got with Him. I'm not satisfied with what I have with Him. I'm not saying I shouldn't be. I should be. So how does He do that? He doesn't fix all of my circumstances so that I feel better about him, what does he do? He teaches me his sufficiency in circumstances that are insufficient. And he teaches me his security in circumstances that would feel insecure. That I have to choose between living for the lie and living for the truth. I wrote it down this way. I said, the modern version of the lie of the enemy. The modern version of the lie. It's always been the same lie. But the modern lie of the enemy of your soul is that different circumstances, if it would just be different, better, bigger, more, fill in the blank, right? Better health, bigger income, more whatever. If I could just have something different, that different circumstances would give greater peace. And I'm here to tell you, it's a lie. You and I think to some degree today that if something were to change in my circumstance, then I would enjoy life more. And I promise you, the message of Scripture, the message of Christ's life, is that the, for me, the bigger office or the better car, or less trips to the mechanic, does not produce a better life. But that's what I think. Not being in pain, not having any conflict, having all the affirmation, having more contributors, and I'm just talking about me today, all right? Having what I want in my circumstance does not improve my life. And only to the degree that I believe that do I experience his sufficiency instead of wanting it from everything else. I can't want life from the world and experience the life that I have in Christ. Jesus said it this way, you can't serve both God and mammon, which is just materialism. 
I can't live for the stuff and live from God at the same time. That's not his purpose. So if I'm living from him, it's not going to be for the stuff. For the circumstances. It just never works. And how many believers are frustrated in their relationship with God and in their circumstances because he's not producing the circumstances they want? All of us? At least some of the time? How many believers who have been crucified with Christ and no longer live but don't believe that? And have been resurrected with Christ and their life is now in him but don't really believe that? And have been by the power of God that raised Christ from the dead, not only raised but risen with him and seated with him and glorified with him and are in him and he's in them and seated, resting in the finished work of Christ. How many believers is that true of? All of them. But they're waiting for what they feel like they lack. We have all things in Christ who has all things from God and we're wanting that to cause what we think we lack in our circumstances. The only way I can have everything from God and still be lacking something in my circumstances is if God and I come to the place of agreeing that what I feel like I'm lacking in my circumstances is nothing. It's nothing. The bigger, more, better, different, fill in the blank, is nothing. You want a bigger house? Let me tell you, a bigger house is nothing. You want a better car? I want to not take my wife's car back to the mechanic tomorrow. <laughs> I want the circumstances to be different. Let me tell you, the difference in your circumstances is nothing. If anything, it is the context in which you get to experience Christ's life. And if it is not the context in which you're going to choose to experience Christ's life, what you will experience in the more, better, bigger, different, whatever it is, what you will experience is death if it's not Christ. What you will experience in a bigger house is death if it's not Christ in his favor in your life with him. And you're just enjoying him. You're going, God, I didn't need that, but thank you. I know it's from you. And I'm enjoying you in that, not that. Does that make sense? What I want... I was about to lie to you. Not intentionally. Caught myself. What I wish that I wanted is more of him in every circumstance. And what I want is for him to cause more of what I want in every circumstance. Can you be honest like that with yourself? I mean, if I can stand in front of a crowd and say that in front of, well, I don't know, a couple hundred people on video, I mean, can you be honest with yourself, just to yourself, just between you and God, that maybe you don't want more of him in your experience in every circumstance. Maybe, maybe you just wish that you wanted that. And what you really want is that he would bring about more of what you want in every circumstance. Because I think if I can admit my flesh in that, and I can say I'm an unbelieving believer. Yeah? I believe that intellectually, but it's not really what I want. So, God, I want to want something differently, but it's not what I want. I want the circumstances to be different, not for you to be sufficient. I want your sufficiency to bring about what I want circumstantially. I don't want your peace to give me peace in the midst of crisis. I want you to get rid of the crisis. I don't want your joy to be enough joy for me to have unhappy circumstances and joy in my fellowship with you. For it to be enough. I don't want you to be enough, God. I want you to cause what I want to be enough. Can you admit that? Because I think the moment I can admit that what I want is not what he wants for me is the moment he can start changing my heart. Because I can say, God, I don't trust you, but I'm willing to trust you if you'll change my heart. I trust you, but I don't completely trust you. I'm learning to trust you. I'm learning your sufficiency. I'm learning dependence. I'm growing in intimacy. But I'm still protective. I'm still, still self-justifying. I'm still desiring things from the world. And God, I need you to change my heart. I can't change my heart. All I can do is lie about it. I can't change my heart. All I can do is lie about it. So I can tell you that I don't want anything from the world. That's just a lie, right? I can say, God, I'm trusting you with this circumstance. But I'm only saying that because I think that's what I have to say in order to get what I want in the circumstance. He's not enough to me in my circumstance and my own thinking. I'm thinking if I say that, then he'll make the circumstance more than I want. But I'm somehow bribing him by acting religious. And the moment that I can admit that, the scales fall away from my eyes and I can say, okay, God, now I really do want whatever you want for me because I see everything apart from you as nothing. Alright, let's go a little further. The 
the truth is that we have peace. The more, better, bigger, different, whatever will never be more, bigger, better peace. Why? Because the circumstance, good or bad, was never the source or the obstacle to the peace that you have in Christ. That's why having Him is peace. He is my peace. And apart from Him, there is no peace. So any peace you're ever going to have is going to be Him. If you want peace in your relationships, let me tell you, the only peace you're going to ever find in any of your relationships is your peace with Him. Is Jesus Christ. Because as he meets your needs, you aren't going to have conflict with anybody else. But as you have those needs of somebody else, guess what that's going to create? Tug of war. I want to be right and you want to be right and I want what I want from you and you want what you want from me and I wish you were doing more of this. Let me tell you, you can be right about that all day long, but you being right will never give you peace. You being right about that is inaccurate. You're accurate about that, that you deserve something different and they should have done something different and circumstances should be different. You being accurate in your thinking will never make you righteous. You either are righteous or you're not righteous. You just happen to be logical and reasonable and accurate in what you're saying. That doesn't make you right. Only he can make you right. The problem is I still have my hope in me making me right. And you're the object lesson of my rightness. Because you're the wrongness and I'm the rightness. So I can feel better about myself. And if you're not going to meet my needs, then you've got to be wrong and we're not going to be at peace. Because I can't afford to think wrongly about myself. But if I could see myself as God has not only seen me, but made me, that I am righteous because of my relationship with him. It was never about behavior. It was never about my thinking. It was always about a relationship, that that is what righteousness is. Then I can see myself as righteous, whether I'm accurate or inaccurate, whether I'm doing the right thing or not doing the right thing, that it's a relationship that makes me right, not a behavior or a way of thinking that makes me right. Then I can admit when I'm wrong, because it doesn't cost me my righteousness then I can confess my inability because it doesn't sacrifice my justification. I don't have to defend myself to you when he has been my defense against the accuser. Verses 15 and 16 say this. Uh, it picks up mid-sentence from the last verse where it said... Um, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. It goes right on. The way that he did that was by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. So by abolishing the law, anybody who's trying to make the law work in their Christian life, take them to this verse. What did Jesus do? Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus abolished the law. Uh, that's big to me. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he, so that was necessary for him to do this, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Killing the hostility. The only way I can respond to you with hostility is if I'm trying to hold up some standard that I can that I can pass and you don't. You and I are in conflict because I'm better than you. By, and here's the dividing line. I'm right and you're wrong. I need and you should supply. I have and you haven't. The only way I can have hostility with you is if I'm holding you responsible for something I feel like I've past. I'm being the Pharisee to you and the hostility of my condemnation towards you or your hostility towards me of having condemned you, right? Whether I'm playing the sinner or you're playing the sinner or I'm playing the Pharisee or you're playing the Pharisee. It is the law that always, the nature of the law that divides us. And he in his flesh abolished the law on the cross so that he himself might be the peace between you and I because the law has been abolished. I can't condemn you with anything because he didn't condemn you and he who saved me saved you. So how can I condemn you? How can I hold anything against you? How can you ever be wrong to me when I was wrong and he made me right? And if he's right enough for both of us, then guess how I get to treat you? Like you're right. Even if you're inaccurate. Even if you don't get me. Even if you're further along than I am or I'm further along than you are. We're both right in Christ. I, can't, I can afford suddenly to treat you as someone who is right in Christ. Because it doesn't cost me anything 
for you to be righteous by grace. By killing the old man, the old nature, Jesus killed the hostility that was between a bunch of old men. Listen, the old men are dead. Who are you condemning? Who are you upset with? Christ in them? The old dead person in them? Or the unbeliever that doesn't know Christ and has no hope except to live from the old man? Who are we upset with? God? <laughs> If God is enough, then anyone who makes me their enemy isn't my enemy. Because God is enough. What hostility could I have against anyone when I'm living, standing in grace? When I deserve God's hostility and have been set free and he is sufficient for my needs, why would I ever be hostile towards anyone else? Now, I don't have this down. I'm just seeing this in my own life. Right? I'm just a flannel graph of flesh. I'm just telling you where I am. Instead of our killing each other by our hostility, taking our unrighteousness out on each other, using the law against one another, Jesus, instead of saying, whoever can be more righteous, whoever can condemn everybody else, whoever can justify, whoever's right and whoever's wrong, that's how it's all going to shake out. Instead, he took all the hostility on himself, so there's no hostility left for the people that you and I are upset with. There is no hostility left. He killed the hostility. Killing the hostility. God is no longer hostile towards anyone. He's extended grace to everyone and a few have accepted. And even those of us who have accepted that grace often don't walk in it. We want to walk in the hostility. In the old dead man that we no longer are. We can't be lawful by using the law against other people. We can't say, you're not doing well enough. You're not accomplishing what you need to. You're not meeting my standard. You're not giving me what I deserve. You're not accomplishing what's required. You're not competent enough in a circumstance. We can't set a standard for someone else and thereby defend ourselves. My condemnation of anyone does not add any righteousness to me. And that's exactly why we use the law. We're trying to use the law against someone else in order to justify ourselves. And as soon as I see it, the scales can fall away from my eyes. As soon as I can say you are not justified or unjustified by being right and wrong in what you do, you are justified or unjustified in what Christ has done on your behalf. And by the way, so am I. Apart from him, I'm wrong. And in him, I'm right. But only because of him. Only because of him. And it removes all the hostility that I have for anyone. We can't be lawful. It doesn't make us lawful by using the law, some standard against anyone else. So here's what happened. God had chosen a group of people in order to reveal himself and claim them, adopt them as his children. It was through that Israel, uh, Israelite nation that he brought about the law and he brought about Christ and he put his name on them. Not because they deserved it, not because they did something great, but just because he needed to reveal himself. And so he chose a few clouds to shine his light through. And having done that, they said, well, we're the chosen ones and everybody else are the unchosen. We're the circumcision who have the promise revealed in the flesh. We're doing something to show who we belong to. It's the equivalent of, you know, a, a little swoosh on my lapel, right? Here's the, what I'm about. Here's who I am. I'm meeting the standard and you're not. I'm, I, this is my brand, my association, my people group. Go Spurs, go, right? This is my association. I'm in and you're out. And by creating an us and them, here's what God did. He said, they're no more deserving than you are, but I've chosen them so that one day when I choose you, you'll receive it. You'll accept it. And here's what he did. They became all self-righteous going, we're the ones that received the law. We're the chosen ones. Of course, they broke it as much as everybody else. Right? But because it made them pharisaical, it made them self-righteous, they pretended to meet the law and made up laws to meet the laws. So I'm breaking the law over here, but I'm keeping all of these laws. And in my mind, I'm saying, well, I'm keeping all of these laws, so I must be lawful. Just because I'm keeping all these laws, I'm still, as Jesus pointed out in Matthew 5, I'm still lusting, I'm still hating, I'm still coveting, I'm still selfful in every way. And even the laws that I'm keeping, I'm just doing so that I can be self-righteous. It has nothing to do with God. And so the lawful were being unlawful because they were fulfilling the letter and missing the heart of the law the whole time. 
from the beginning. And so there's an us and them, and there's this line that the Israelites drew that God allowed for them to say there's an us and a them. And then in Jesus Christ, he's going to, in his flesh, crucify all the hostility between the us and the them. Now who in your life are the us and the them? Who's on the other side of the cultural divide? Who's on the other side of the financial divide? Who's on the other side of the managerial divide or spousal divide or whatever the divide is? Who is the us and the them in your circumstances? Who is causing, creating, allowing, receiving conflict with you? Anyone conflicted today? Anyone in conflict with anybody? Anyone honest enough to feel like you've been a little self-righteous towards others, even if they're wrong? Who made you right? Christ or no one? Either you're right in Christ, and they're right in Christ, or you're not right at all. It's one or the other. You can't be lawful by using the law against someone else. Their wrongness doesn't add to your rightness. You're either right by grace, or you're not right. We need to start saying accurate a whole lot more than right. I'm right and you're wrong. Well, I'm accurate and you're inaccurate, but we're both screwed up. That's what we need to be saying all the time. I'm wrong by lesser degree than you are. <laughs> that's, maybe that's closer, right? Because you're not right by anything you do, say, think, have done, haven't done. Here's the great news. You're not unrighteous by anything you do, say, think, done, or haven't done. You're right in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you're not right at all. And there's no other way to be right. And there's nothing to be held against anybody else. And you don't lose any value when they're right. And you don't gain any value when they're wrong. You are not your defense. You are not your source. And they certainly aren't. I don't know who's on the other side of the line of hostility in your life. I don't know who that is but there's somebody because it's in the midst of chaos and conflict that Jesus Christ wants to be your peace. Not because you've deserved it and brought it about by being right in your behavior and thinking, but because he wants to be your peace where you are in conflict that you don't deserve. He wants to be your peace. Why? So that amidst the clouds, he can show you what light looks like instead of just showing you what light reveals. Because that's how he's going to glorify himself. There's this grace Pharisee movement going on in America today where we're going, well, there's an us and them. Those of us who are teaching New Covenant, those of us who are teaching a, a, an economy of grace, those of us that are you know, on the right side of this issue of the finished work of Jesus Christ and our union with him and our rest in him and his finished work on our behalf, that we're the us and they're the them, let me tell you, in Jesus Christ there is no them. We are on their team. They are us. I used to put it this way. I'm getting a little bit better of actually believing this. But it's kind of like we say, here's a pen and a pencil. It's kind of like we say, you're so wrong. I'm so much further than you are. And Jesus Christ is like in, you know, on the moon. <laughs> and he's looking back from way over here going, yeah, you're both only right because I love you. Neither one of you are very far along. And everybody that we would condemn, they're like, you know, barely behind us in the overall scheme of things. We're going, oh, you're so far behind. I like to play with figures, I guess. I need my puppets. <laughs> I didn't plan this. That's why it's such a disaster. Here you go. So, so you know, we're, we're lording our position, our rightness, our intellect, our ability over somebody else. And Jesus Christ is like in infinite distance away going, yeah, you're, you're doing all right. It's okay. I love you. I mean, from there, we can't look very different, right? And that's what we're arguing about, the difference between where I am and where they are, and we're both, apart from grace, so screwed up that only grace can save us and them, that only grace makes me right and only makes them right. And it does make me right. And you know what it does? It takes me, who's maybe a little bit more accurate than them or a little less wrong in some specific area than them, and it puts all, both of us all the way with Christ, exactly where he is, in him, because in him there is no difference between that person and me. There is no difference. You can be in no greater unity with the person of Jesus Christ than you are in unity with everyone else he's in unity with. You are one with that person you're in conflict with and to condemn them is to condemn you. 
because you need as much grace as they do. And you have all the grace you need as they do. Does that make sense? You don't need less grace than they do. You don't need any less grace than they do. Okay. I want to apply this and, and then we'll close. I, I want to look at something. This no us and them idea. Uh, put up that next point for us, Scott. It says, the incarnational activity of Christ, the very nature of Jesus coming to where we are because we couldn't get to where he is. His willingness to be where we are. The very incarnational activity of Christ means that to be with him is to be for others. I can't be against anyone and be with Christ because he's incarnational. If I am with him, I have to be for everyone because that's what God is. He came to save, not to condemn. He is for everyone everyone. He died for everyone. And not everybody's rece received it, but there's no one that he excludes, only people that exclu exclude themselves. And so he is for everyone. He wishes that no one would perish. And so if that's true, then I can't be against anyone that he is for and still be with him. I'm either in conflict with God if I'm in conflict with everybody else, or I'm walking in fellowship with God and I hold nothing against anyone. There's nothing, uh, there's no other option. Now, I struggle with this all the time because people wrong me. Anybody wronged you? Here's the great news. Because Jesus was wronged and I'm wronged, that just proves that I'm right by grace. And if they're a believer, they're right by grace. And if they're not a believer, then they have no option but to be wrong anyway. They need the same grace that I need, so I don't have to hold it against anybody. If Jesus could take the condemnation for something that he did not do, then I can take the condemnation for something that they deserve, too. There's no hostility because his grace is sufficient. There's no hostility because my union with him is their union with him. And as he draws me to him, he draws that person to them. And I am no closer to Christ than I am to the other people that he has drawn to himself. I cannot get closer to him than to everyone else that he draws. I can't be in greater union with him than I am in union. Oneness with everybody else that he is in unity with. And I may not like them. And guess what? I bet Jesus sometimes looks at me and goes, man, if it was just based on your behavior, Mike, you and I'd have nothing going for us. But praise God, it's based on my character, not your behavior, and you and I are one, and I don't want to do anything without you, and I want my life to be shared completely with you, and I want to live from within you, and you and I are in it together forever. Because that's what I want. I want you. It's not based on my behavior. It's based on his character. But guess where he wants to live that character out from? You. Welcome to the clouds. You get to be the ray of God's light amidst the clouds of this world. You get to demonstrate the glory of God because nothing that is going on in your life is a liability to your life in Christ if Christ is really enough. So I don't know where you're dividing that line. I don't know where you are not for others that are in conflict with you. But we can, by grace, bridge the gap just like Jesus did that self-righteousness demands, that gap that we cause because Jesus abolished the law that separates us, that condemns us, that we use against each other. In fact, you can't be with Christ without being for them. And that's the very thing that Jesus chose to do, that he would be with us and for us when we deserved for him to do the exact opposite. Is there anybody that deserves your wrath? Is there anybody that deserves your rejection? It's anybody that warrants your being upset with him. That warrants hostility. I've got a couple of those conversations coming up this week. And it's hard. Because they deserve my wrath. They do. But I don't have greater peace because they receive my wrath. I don't have more life because I steal something from theirs. That's just not where life is. Either I believe that and I don't hold them accountable for what they can't cost me anyway, or I don't believe it and I do hold them accountable and I try to take it from them. Take some of their life in order to make my life better. One or the other. Either they're my source or God's my source. If God's my source, I don't need anything from them. I still need everything, but not from them. I need it from him. And I've got it from him. And he's enough for me. Is there somewhere you can apply that? Is there an us and them where you need to cross the line and become them so that they can become us? The last little section there says this, verse uh, 17 to 22 says, 
Well, we'll read to 21. And he came, Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far off. You weren't the original chosen. You weren't the Jews. You weren't the ones that knew the law. You weren't the ones that walked with God. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. That he was the peace both for the Jews and for the Gentiles. He was the only way. He was the only source. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, you and them, us and them, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. God's purpose, God's purpose is fulfilled. Not just in bringing us near to him, but in near to one another. God's purpose is fulfilled not just by you being reconciled to God, but you being reconciled together with everybody else that's reconciled to God. It's the us-ness of the body of Christ that is to the glory of God. Because guess what? Not only do we not deserve it from him, but we don't deserve it from each other. And which is more obvious to the world around us. Because there's a whole lot of light, but until there's clouds, you can't tell that there's light. And so, the togetherness that we share by the grace of God is much more potent to the people that are in, under the clouds and in the storms and looking at the world, uh, looking at the body of Christ from the world. That's going to make it obvious because we are... Uh, put up that picture again for us, Scott. Can you look at that last picture? These look like they're coming from a point and spreading out. They look like they're doing this. But really, they're all coming from the sun, and so they're almost parallel. The only reason they look like they're coming out, like just the other side of the clouds, like someone, you know, some angel is in the clouds with a flashlight and it's doing this. The only reason it looks that way is because of perspective. So if, if it's the same reason that uh, train tracks look like they're getting closer together. They're not. They're parallel. Everybody that God has called, he's equally called. We're all walking the same path. We're all moving the same direction. But from where we sit, it often looks like some are closer than others, and some are moving away from each other, and some are... Perspective changes things. So when the world looks at us, it sees, okay, everybody is emanating from the life that is Christ, but in reality, we're all just walking together. We're all just living parallel lives of our life in Christ. We all have union with him, and we're all walking parallel paths in the world with him as our source. We're not, does that make sense? We're not in different degrees of unity. We're all in. There's only one light. There aren't a thousand little lights and there's not a source right there that's shooting it all out of different directions. We're all walking the same path. We're all in the same life. We're all displayed in the same world. We're one body emanating from one spirit, Scripture says, for one purpose, and it's the glory of God. You do not have to prove yourself in this life. God's purpose is fulfilled not just in bringing us near to him, but near to one another. And then finally, the last point that I'll make this evening is that the infinitely wide angle panorama. If you were to span out and say, okay, not only am I looking at my little life, and not only am I looking at the handful of people that I'm walking through this life with, and not only am I looking at what the body of Christ is doing as the light of the world, but if I pan out far enough to see us within the context of the world infinitely wide panorama of God's glory on the earth from eternity past to eternity future is going to be God's glory revealed in all of us as it says in this passage being built up together. It's not your role in the wall as a brick. It's going to be the diversity of all of us in it together. Think about what he's saying. He's telling the, the Jews that the Gentiles get to share in the same temple. That they're being built on the same foundation. That they're part of the same structure. That they are equal in value and equal in purpose, though they're diverse in their role. Why? Because the infinite nature of God is going to be revealed in the finite members of the body of Christ by seeing the variegated manifestation of his life in each one of us. That I'm different and have a different role and different gifts than you, and you're different and have a different role and different gifts from me, and that there's an us and a them from the world's perspective, but we have unity in God. Because of that variegated nature, that manifold revelation of the sufficiency of Christ, that you are in union with me when I'm nothing like you. We don't have the same personality. We don't have the same 
roles and gifts and opportunities. We're entirely different. And the unity that we have in the midst of that difference is going to be to the glory of God, maybe more than anything else in this life. When Paul wrote to the Colossians in uh, chapter 1, verse 27, and he said, And what he revealed, the mystery revealed in you is this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The you there is plural. Christ in you, the body. Individually in each one of us, revealed corporately in the body, is the hope of the glory of God. The sum of the parts of the temple reveals something different than the individual parts do on their own. What God will show the world through you and what he shows through me are going to be very different things. But what the world is going to see ultimately in the glory of God is going to be revealed by the panoramic picture of what we all do by his grace for his glory together. Our unity serves in that all of our diversity reveals the fullness of God as we choose dependently on him to love one another where we don't deserve it. Let me put it to you this way. <clears throat> There's not a person that you know, not a single person, who deserves your love. They haven't earned it. Are you going to love them? There's not a single person you know who has earned, deserves, is causing your affirmation and acceptance unconditionally in their life. Not a single person. Not one. Except for Christ himself. Yes, there's one. Are you going to accept them? Are you going to embrace them? Are you going to walk in unity with them? There's not a single person who deserves for you to see them as righteous based on their behavior and their thinking because we're all in error in our thinking. We're growing in our understanding. We're growing in our dependence. We're growing in our intimacy with Christ. No one but Christ himself has arrived. But that Christ who has arrived is in you. And though you are perfect in your union with him and his nature and his power and his possession, you are learning to live out of all you are and all you have. And you're learning that imperfectly. And I'm learning that imperfectly. And so the question is not whether or not we're going to become better at the Christian life. We're going to be better at accomplishing what he wants as the body. The question is, as I'm in conflict, am I going to trust him for what I need and admit that my need is real and admit that I'm insufficient and incompetent at producing it so that he can love where people don't deserve it and he can embrace where people don't deserve it and he can bridge the gap where people don't deserve it so I can be the incarnational body of Christ with you to a world that cannot see the light apart from the clouds? Can we embrace the clouds so that the light will be revealed? That's the question. Can he be your peace amidst chaos, or is he only as good as he eliminates the chaos in your life and the conflict in your life? That's the question. And I think as we're going to see when he moves into chapter 3, that very last verse there is worth reading. <laughs> I love this. Verse 22 says, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Christ is in you. The Spirit is moving us into union. And the result is the glory of God. The Trinity is at work to reveal the Father through the Son in the body by the work of the Spirit. And you are a participant in that glorious work. If we're not too busy getting our own needs met from each other. That's it. That's the math. He is bringing about his glory and you and I get to play a part. And it won't cost us anything except what we want from each other. It won't cost us anything except what we want from each other. The question is, what you need, do you need it from the people that you think you deserve it from? Or what you need, will it be met from the sufficiency of Christ and he can use you in other people's lives? You're either available to him or you're needy from each other. That's it. Only options. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that what you have called us to is bigger than just a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. You have called each of us into a union with you that brings us into union with one another. That we cannot experience you fully apart from our relationship with you. That I get to experience your life in each person in this room and each person who knows you. Father, I praise you that the only 
dividing line between us and them as those who have received your work and those that have not yet received your work on our behalf. And that our receiving it doesn't merit what you've done for us. It just makes it available to us. God, I pray that we would not be pursuing what we want you to do in our circumstances, but that we would be pursuing you as sufficient for everything that we need in life. And that you tonight would use the very things that are creating conflict or chaos, an unpeace in our circumstances. You use those very things to bring us to deeper dependence in your sufficiency so that by your glory we would walk in your power and strength. And that God, in the midst of the light that you shine through the body tonight and this week, amidst the clouds of the world and circumstances, your glory would be revealed to a dark and dying world that desperately needs to know who you are. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.